What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another uh, leak reading. This is a reaction to the second story in Somnophobia, which is pressure. So, I've heard this one is insane. Uh, <laughs> and by insane, I mean, like, under construction was nothing. Help wanted was nothing. B7 was nothing. Apparently, this one is a huge fan service. Uh, a lot of cool references and stuff, so I'm so excited to see what this is all about. Uh, if you enjoy, make sure you tell me in the comments below. Anyway, let's get straight into this. Okay, so Luca, we're following Luca. Luca jolted and Stutter stepped forward. He threw out a hand to brace himself from the nearest wall. He ground his teeth and turned to glare at his friend. Cut it out, Nolan. They're high school seniors visiting a day at the Pizzaplex before they head off to the end of senior year. Nolan's the rough guy of the group, always fake fighting with his friends all the time, albeit still being a jackass from time to time. Luca shook his head and took his hand. He pulled Nolan upright. Nolan grinned uh, even wider and pulled Luca into a half hug. Luca gave into the hug, but he wants to shove the big oaf away. Big oaf. <laughs> yeah, he, Ash, and, o and Nolan had been hanging out together for a long time, but lately Luca wasn't sure why he spent time with his two so-called buddies. Well, actually, Asher wasn't the problem, it was Nolan. Ever since Nolan had started dating Maddie, he'd been acting like they were a royal couple. Which wasn't so hard when Maddie, Luca's longtime friend, had been crowned homecoming queen this year. Now Luca felt like she, uh, Luca felt like he and Asher were king and queen's subjects, and he didn't like that feeling. Should I be jealous? Referring to the hug, Maddie asked, possessively putting her arm around Nolan's waist. She winked at Luca and wigged, wiggled her eyebrows at him. Just like that, yep. Nope, nope, that is, that is not describing that. Anyway, he sighed and turned away when Nolan leaned down and kissed his dark haired and distractingly pretty girlfriend. Manny's jealousy was pretend, Luca's wasn't. Luca had been in love with Maddie long before Nolan had made his move on her. You snooze, you lose, Nolan had said when Luca had suggested that asking the girl your friend uh, was crazy about wasn't particularly cool. Um, Come on, you guys, Asher said. Stop messing around. Check out these costumes. Let's pick a scenario so we can decide who you want to be. Asher and Luke are both kind of third wheeling. These assholes, Nolan and Maddie, are making out in the middle of the plex for no reason. <laughs> Setting up the characterization of them being a very annoying couple. I love that. That's great. Ash, however, is with Luca on the sense that he's annoyed by them as well. Okay, so it's like a 2v2. Ash is a theatre kid, unfortunately. <laughs> as a kid, he would always invite Sam and Maddie over to a pretend court because his Ash's dad was an attorney. Because Ash's dad was an attorney. Okay. Luca used to play the opposing lawyer. They argued negligence cases. Uh, Asher might not have known what the word meant, but he loved it because his dad used it all the time. Luke is an athlete and a scholarship in athletics. He wishes to join the NFL as a coach. Um, uh, <laughs> the story says the NFL. I love this. Uh, Ash wants to become a direct, uh, an actor. And it unfortunately takes a, an effect on him. Not in the sense it's bad, but like weird. Luca had noticed Ash's gestures and facial expressions were becoming more and more exaggerated. They have just entered the costume closet. Their first stop in Freddy Fazbear's mega, mega Pizzaplex roleplay venue. We were right about this because we saw the roleplay venue in both Under Construction and Haps. Uh, Urban Legend Roleplayers Auditorium. Urban Legend. Imagine we saw the si Stitch race. That would be incredible. That would be such a good way to confirm Stitch Line games. Um, the huge room, which looked like an obsessive, crazy rich person's mega closet, was filled with hanging rods and shelves and cubby holes. All of these were stuffed with animal suit heads, um, clothes, shoes, and other accessories. According to Asher, who had read up on the game before they'd arrived to play it, the colour codes on the cubby holes were associated with various roleplay scenarios offered in the auditorium. Once you chose what story you wanted to play out, you picked the costumes accordingly. You know, the power I have right now is unspeakable to send this next quote because there is... This is where the fan service starts, and it starts off with a fucking jump scare. Not like an actual jump scare, but a jump scare seeing him there. Wait, really? Oh no, okay. I have so much power right now, I don't know if I should send it. Like, 
I, I could go on with my day as usual, not letting anyone know who's there. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and do it. Lucas spotted a few of his classmates checking out Golden Freddy. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? What? No shot. There's a Golden Freddy costume? Excuse me? Is it like a is it like a two person costume? I'm joking. <laughs> a three person costume. That's insane. That's so good. Okay. Um They had the audacity to name him Golden Freddy. Oh! Yeah, like this is this is a quote from the book. Yeah, they called him Golden Freddy. Fazbear Entertainment a cano canonically calls him that. That's mad. Um it's a tease, you don't get any more shit to him other than that. Like, nothing happened. Okay, that's fine. I'm honestly fine with that. It's really cool that they just mentioned that. Uh, he saw a couple of little girls arguing over who was going to wear a Chica costume, all of whom whose favourite character was, in fact, Chica. The power of this story, man. Luca eyed a security guard suit, even though security guards didn't generally fare well in Fazbear Entertainment games. Luca wanted to be a guard. He liked the idea of being a hero. Luca and his friends had been talking about the roleplay auditorium since uh, ever since the Pizzaplex had opened. The VR venue in the Pizzaplex was great, but being on a real set sounded like way more fun. This is definitely same time as Haps and as the other one under construction. Definitely, it's they all these all these stories take place like at the beginning of the Pizzaplex. Definitely, because this is how they all get shut down because of the incidents. Uh, hey, so did anyone want confirmation still, like, without a doubt, confirmation of if the Pizzaplex is in the games? You can rest now. Oh, no, okay, okay. The Urban Legend Role Players Auditorium was set up for reenacting many of the rumours and ghost stories that had become associated with the Fazbear Entertainment brand over the year. The years. Wait, as in, so, like, the Fazbear Frights? Luca is on the conspiracy side. He actually is on the side of people that thinks Fazbear Entertainment is actually capitalising on the murders. Okay. He thought the auditorium was a great marketing ploy. He was pretty sure the th stories were more fact than myth or rumours. He'd read about the kids who disappeared. He'd read about the kids who disappeared, and he had no problem imagining their corpse stuffed away in the old Freddy locations, their ghosts finding a way to haunt the animatronics that were supposedly still in the abandoned restaurant. I just wanted to say this is just scratching the surface of how insane the story is. Really? Oh my gosh. If Fazbear Entertainment couldn't shake the rumours, why not le lean into them and make some money off of the believers? Believers like him. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Asher called for Luca's attention. He pointed at a menu board of stories on the wall near the closet's entrance. Look at this one, Asher said. It's called Green Eared Killer. It's about three teens who break into the, Fred at, into the Fazbear's Fright haunted house and are stalked by Springtrap. They have to try to get away before he kills them. This is amazing. This is so good. You guys caught it on. Uh, yeah, you guys caught it on. The roleplay arena is a uh, dead by daylight in real life type situation, not just roleplaying. There's a scoring game to it. That's really cool. I like this concept for a story so far. Just where is this going to go? I have no idea. Murderous animatronics are just stupid, Maddie said as she flipped her hair. They aren't stupid. Why do you think Fazbear Entertainment got the ideas for all their games? You think they just plucked the notion of dangerous animatronics out of the clear blue sky? You think it's a coincidence that nearly all... Good detail I noticed. Uh, their game scenarios have to do with security guards... <laughs> security guards on trespassers trying to avoid being killed. Yet yeah, nearly all because of like FNAF 4. Yeah. Look, see, all the scenarios have to do with trying to survive a night in the security office or trying to stay alive while patrolling the old restaurant or trying to keep a music box going so the ghost doesn't get you. This is definitely part of the games. Definitely. 100%. This is amazing. Luke is a fan of the franchise and the conspiracies. Luca felt himself getting worked up. He was sick of having to defend his interests. It's genius, actually. I think Phasma Entertainment is trying to make light of all the stories. And why is that? Because there's truth to them. They keep coming up with games that, you, that have you crawling through vents and slamming doors and hiding inside costumes because they know that their animatronics got out of control and killed people. It's all true. He went off on a tangent. Yeah, this is a really good quote, actually. That's a really good quote. Uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just saying creating games to make light of a bad reputation is a great way to downplay the lies. 
Luca made air quotes, being told about the company. We definitely saw that side, we, we definitely saw that aspect with Help Wanted. Um, that's, that's basically what Brock Edwards was, was saying to, to Steve. Whatever, Maddie said. I want to be a damsel in distress. Let's play green eared killer. I'll be one of the teens. Let's go, stud boy, she said to Nolan. Nolan grinned at the nickname Maddie had started using for him. I'll be the cool dude, Nolan said. Everyone goes ahead and picks their roles immediately before Luca even got the chance to be. Uh, to, to. You have to be Springtrap. The killer? Luca shook her head. Um, the book has, to, has this typo. Oh, because Luca, yeah, Luca shook his head. No, oh, never mind. Uh, no way, I'm not going to be uh, the killer. You got no choice. Luca and Nolan almost get in a fight of, uh, over arguing over Springtrap. Luca doesn't want to be Springtrap and Nolan says he has no choice. Gross ass men, uh, grown ass men, by the way. Cut it out, you two. You're not going to fight over a role playing game, Maddie said. Nolan leaned toward the row of costumes. He picked a, he plucked a ratty looking puke yellow green rabbit suit off the rack. Wow, this thing is realistic. It's not only gross looking, it stinks. Oh my god. This is totally setting up the fact that this is the actual Springtrap costume. Hang on. I need a minute to process this. That is 100%. Like, if this was a detail that was put in the book just because why not? then why? Like, seriously. This has to mean it is the real Springtrap costume. I'm... I am... Wait! So does that mean that Scraptrap is a different costume then? I'm assuming that means Scraptrap is... is like, William got out of the Springtrap, went into the Scraptrap. Hmm... Okay. We'll do theorizing later, I guess. They're all peer pressuring, pressure, yeah, pressuring him and calling him childish for not wanting to put the suit on. Luca talks about not wanting to be the killer and that he would never want to even pretend to be one. Manny has a pep talk with him. You remember how pissed you were when I crashed your bike into Mr. Weenberg's mailbox? Luca smiled at the memory. Yeah, I remember how pissed I was. Exactly my point, Manny said. Channel that feeling. She grabbed the suit and held it out to Luca, put on the frickin' suit. It really was an abomination. Like all the Fazbear Entertainment animal creatures, or characters, sorry, this rabbit was a caricature of an ordinary rabbit, like a rabbit created in an evil scientist lab, with torn ears and patches of yellow-green fur ripped away. The suit's substructure was exposed in several places. It looked old and rusty. Or was that rust? The reddish splotches. It could have been something else. After all, the Springtrap suit had been won by a killer. At least that was the story. He wasn't sure why he abhorred the idea of putting on the suit. His problem with being Springtrap didn't lie with the costume. It had to do with who Springtrap was. Wow. Wow. According to Fazbear Mythology. <laughs> Fazbear Mythology. That's great. Uh, Springtrap was the alter ego, the evil persona of William Afton. What? They freaking name drop Afton. I am... I'm already amazed at this story. Like, we're not even halfway through, definitely. Uh, we're, ha we're hardly through. This is amazing. In Fast of Frights, we were only name-dropped Afton. I don't think we were ever told it was William Afton. Obviously, that's... Yeah, obviously it was William Afton, but we never got William Afton as a name. This is insane. The evil persona of William Afton, the man who had kidnapped and killed little kids at a Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria. Afton had gotten trapped in a rabbit suit and had eventually died, sort of. In those nightmarish rumours associated with Freddy's, Afton's corpse had come back to life and thus had become Springtrap. Yeah, guys, I was ex over-exaggerating the story. <laughs> no, but really, it gets better. And by that, I mean the story. It's not the only callback we get. Fazbear Entertainment made light of this fable, as they called it. He had no trouble imagining the suit animated by a real killer. For some reason, he didn't know why. He almost immediately dropped the suit when handed to him. The suit's fur felt rusty. It was scummy too. This suit is starting to really freak Luca the frick out. He's stalling and insisting that they have that they either leave the game or just pretend he's Springtrap. He doesn't want to wear it. Why don't 
we all play teens and we'll just pretend Springtrap is after us. What was wrong with not wanting to pretend to play as a murdering maniac? That was the problem, they didn't understand. They weren't thinking about what really happened, they weren't thinking about the poor, terrified victims. Luca, childhood, trauma, story, lore thing, character build up, he was thinking about the victims, it reminded him of something. When Ashes and Maddie's families had first moved in, a four year old uh, down the street had disappeared and a little, a little boy named Kenny. Luca had known Kenny, used to, he used to play with Kenny as their parents were friends. He liked playing big brother to Kenny as he was the only child. He taught Kenny all kinds of things, how to build a castle out of blocks, how to raise cars off the porch rails, how to catch frogs down by the stream that ran behind the houses. At the time, Luca didn't understand what his parents and Kenny's parents had been talking about when they said he had been kidnapped. He couldn't understand why he wouldn't come back and play. When Kenny's body was found in the same creek Luca and Kenny had played in, Luca's parents tried to explain him uh, why bad people sometimes hurt good little kids. For months after his death, Luca had suffered from a recurring nightmare. Every night, he would hear Kenny scream and cry. He tried to get Kenny to save him. Uh, he tried to get to Kenny to save him. But every night, he watched Kenny die. He still had that dream sometimes. He never talked about Kenny. We don't talk about Kenny. His friends didn't know. <laughs> would they relent if he told him now? Kenny's death is the reason why Luca is not only protective, but wishes he could be there as a figure to make sure everyone is safe and would go out of his way to put himself out of his way to save someone. Because he feels the guilt of not being there to save Kenny. This is why he doesn't want to wear the suit. He does not want to be associated with the very evil act associated with kidnapping. He's going to be dressed and, and put on the suit because he has no choice, all his friends are being assholes to him, and he gives in to appease them. Uh, he went into the dressing room. Nolan called out, You'd better be putting that suit on. If you're not, I'll come in and do it myself. Oh my gosh. This is a... Nolan is a psychopath, I'm telling you. Luca looked at the suit, exhaling loudly. He reached for it. The suit is described as having metal beams that can contract and simply climb inside to fix with the height of the person wearing it. Easy optimization. It's also big enough to just rest on top of the person's body, big enough for them to literally slip their shoes into. Uh, the disgusting rabbit suit came in two pieces. One piece was the head, the other piece was the rest of the body. The suit was kind of like a hideous onesie for demented adults. <laughs> He's having to uncomfortably wedge his body parts into the piece of the suit to fit. He's got the entire suit on now. He looked at himself in the mirror from the neck down. Luca was no longer Luca. He was a mouldering rabbit that had looked like an escapee from an apocalyptic trash heap. From the neck up, Luca still looked like Luca, sort of. Actually, he wasn't quite himself. His skin next to the putrid green fur looked shallow. His forehead glistened with sweat. His eyes looked strained. Dark circles had appeared under them. Or was that just the dressing room's dim lighting? To clarify, he doesn't have the mask on yet, just the suit. Okay. Suddenly the curtain behind him opened. Ash and Nolan came in unprompted and are like, whoa, cool, put the head on, before he gets a chance to even speak. He put the mask on and immediately retched because it smells so bad. Like, really bad, it smells awful. <laughs> Thank you, Anton. <laughs> Luca didn't like this, he didn't like it at all. Ash puts the head down more until something locks it in place to the rest of the suit. Springtrap is now fully suited. The rabbit's mouth was a grim maw of desolation. That is a fire line. Fire line. Um, there's apparently a set of metal glove-like frames that his fingers are encased in. Luca's knuckles beneath the metal felt entrapped and chafed. Ash finally grabs Luca by the spring arm and they all start heading for the game room waiting for the rest of the group to finish dressing up. Luca just sitting there as Springtrap chilling. He saw the little girls from earlier again, one of them finally decided who got to wear the Chica costume, smile. The rest of them are the other band members, seems they're content. Cool. The girls were completely oblivious, oblivious to the Fazbear employee who leaned against the back of the wall of the costume closet. There was a slim, lanky man. The name tag on his uniform read Earl. Vanny... Wait. Oh, okay. For a minute, I thought this was a quote from the book, but it's just Anton saying, Vanny wasn't the only Kinney, it seems. I don't know what Kinney means. Anyway. Um, Luca was looking at the girls too, but his attention on the girls was benign. He thought the girls' antics were cute. Judging from Earl's long, narrow face, Earl didn't see cute. 
His pale blue eyes squinted just slightly and his mouth stretched into a salacious sneer. Uh, Earl's interest in the girls was not benign at all. He was looking at the girls as if they were tasty morsels. His focus was so, well, icky. Lucas stepped forward intending, intending to confront the guy. He stopped when a group of little boys ran in front of him. He didn't want to bump into them. Earl's gaze then shifted to the boys. Maddy came out and called his name, distracting them. He nearly forgot about Earl. When he remembered, he rotated to where Earl was lurking. Earl was gone. This is an interesting direction I did not think the story was going to go in. Um, he's panicking because he can't find where Earl went. He feels as if something really wrong is going on here. Are you coming? Manny tugged Lucas' uh, spring trap arm. He realised he fucked up. Earl being gone, he wanted to try to look for him later or call someone. Now they're going to the game room. Before I refill my beverage and get more popcorn, I'll leave you off with this. <laughs> the staging room for the Green uh, Eared Killer Auditorium was based off the original Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, which also included elements of Fazbear's Fright Haunted House. That's so cool. The original Freddy Fazbear's, which was where the murders happened. That's really cool. Okay. From what Luca read about the urgent le Urban Legends Auditorium prior... All the staging areas were hybrids of multiple locations. Each area was a combined venue packed full of themes from the old stories. Luca had never been to the original Freddy's or Fazbear's Fright, but he played the games. He had an idea from the games as to what the place looked like, and he was blown away by, away by the authenticity of the attraction. The entrance was a decorative, crumbing brick archway. Since the Pizzaplex was relatively new, the archway he was looking at couldn't have been even a year old. Despite it existing for less than a year, it looked like a long-forgotten entrance to a place better not remembered. Look at this, Maddie said. It's totally dope. They passed Pirate's Cove. Even vents to call in. Uh, even vents to call in. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, they're reading the instructions for the game. You're not going to believe this. It's so cool. So the game is basically this. Okay. Each player starts out in the pizzeria and has to make their way out, dead by daylight style, blah, 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 blah. But all players have to be at the escape door to push on it to win to prevent cheating. Oh. So, here's what's going to happen. Not all of them are going to get there and they're all going to be trapped or something and Springtrap is going to come alive. I don't know. <laughs> now, I want you to guess where Springtrap is told to start in. The safe... Oh. My God. I would scream... I would scream, but I don't want to scream. <laughs> the safe room? Excuse me? That is insane. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm going through this very slowly, but this is actually crazy to me. This is mind-blowing. This is the most mind-blowing story we've had so far. 100%. The safe room. Oh my god, if you guys don't shut up, I'll close this book and feed it to my bird. <laughs> You're supposed to go to the safe room. It's a small room at the end of the back hall. You're supposed to go in, close the door, and then wait for it to open again. Then you come and chase us. There's a knife, apparently. Not a real one, though. Got it? Ash said after finding the instructions. Luca nodded, and something rough rubbed at the back of his neck. The rubbing stopped when he adjusted the mask, but the skin felt scratched. The game is starting. He fist bumps Ash, good luck, and felt something poke the underside of his right wrist. Oh, well, nothing to worry about, right? He continues down the hall for the game to start, going to the safe room. For some reason, the suit starts be beginning to feel tight as he goes throughout the building. He's making his way to the safe room. The main stage's curtain is pulled back enough to reveal statues of the original band. Now he enters the hallway to the safe room. This was the hallway. The infamous hallway where Afton had led the children to their demise. The one where the killer to lead the kids to their deaths. Well, it wasn't actually the, the hallway, it was obviously a reproduction, but Luca could have sworn it was the real thing at first. Not only was it authentic to the narrow, dingy hallway of urban legend infamy, it felt like it could easily be the conduit to a very bad place. So, the safe room is co confirmed to be a door that's like a fake passageway you press through the wall near the bathrooms, hence what phone guy meant by fal false wall. Ah oh, yeah, yeah, okay. His steps faltered, he stopped and listened. Sibilant signs, sibilant signs, uh, wafted throughout the hallway. They carried with them the sounds of sobbing and childlike pleas. 
Uh, Luca is frowned. Oh, Luca, Luca frowned, sorry, and shook his head. I'm really bad at reading today. I'm so sorry. Uh, it was just an audio track, he reminded himself. This was a fake haunted house. Fast for Entertainment is capitalizing on the safe room hallway by playing ghostly children cries. This is insane. This is so cool. Something in the suit gouged his arm slightly. He's ducking into the safe room. Apparently it's a little entrance, pushing the wall in. He goes into a pitch black room. The door shuts and locks. Luca tried to open it. The handle wouldn't turn. It's pitch black and he can't find a light switch. The suit is becoming really tight now. He found the rubber knife on the ground in the safe room. Luca picked up the knife. He closed his rabbit fist around the knife's hilt and touched the tip with a rabbit finger. It gave a little good rubber. Goofy ass motherfucker. <laughs> uh, Luca straightened. As he did, the suit pinched him a little tighter around the waist. Something abrasive scraped against his tailbone. Should it be doing this? Could it be? No, he wouldn't let himself think like that. This was just a game. Does he know? Yeah, he knows. He, he knows what's going on. Uh, hey, those who are sensitive to gore, just a heads up for this story. Are you kidding me? No way he gets spring spring locked. This is cool. This is really cool. Uh, Luca quickly headed down the hall. He was ready to pretend kill his friends so he could finish the game and get out of the rabbit suit. Something poked him in the leg. He goes down the hall and he stops uh, when he hears Maddie's voice talking about the animatronic statues in the dining area. Hey, so the attraction has built in spooks. Forgot to mention that. Luca figured now was a good time as any to get into his role. He lifted his rubber knife and he prepared to rush, prepared to rush into the dining room. But then the stage lights suddenly burst on. Even more lights flooded the dining room. 80s rock band music, uh, rock music blared. A kaleidoscope on the ceiling began to spin, throwing fractals of coloured light everywhere. Although the lights and music in and of themselves weren't scary, the sudden contrast from dim and quiet to too bright and loud was disorienting. It supposedly scared the shit out of Nolan. Pussy. <laughs> um, Maddie ducked into Nolan's arms and Asher staggered back into a table. In the harshly covered lights, it was hard to tell, but it looked like Nolan might have gone pale. Good, served him right, served him all right. Asher isn't as much of a pussy, so he recovers quickly. Manny looked around the room, and her initial fearful expression turned to glee. Wow, this is so awesome. She stepped away from Nolan and started dancing. Nolan and Asher laughed and watched at her. What is this bitch doing? Almost as fast as the lights had come on, they went off. The previously dim lights went off too. The entire room was now dark. The haunted house's spooks had gotten to them. Um, Luca would make his move now. He's following him in the dark across the dining room and then accidentally bumped into a chair. The chair scraped across the floor. Nolan swore. The dim lighting returned. Maddie glanced around and saw Luca, his knife raised. She screamed. Her scream was so genuine that it scared him too pulling him out of character and making him uh, want to make sure she was okay. He feels awful at the fact she he scared her. He calls out her name and she uh, just keeps running and screaming. He follows her. Uh, she turns and runs away from the stage, heading in the direction of Pirate's Cove. Luca involuntarily started after her. As he did, the purple and gold curtains swished open. Purple and gold? Oh yeah, okay. Foxy stepped forward and swiped at Maddie with his hook. Foxy surprised Luca as much as he did Maddie. Luca jerked back when the fox's hook sky uh, scythed the air a second time. When Luca jerked, something clamped around his thigh. I don't know why. This is giving me big Silver Eyes vibes. I know the epilogues currently give everyone Silver Eyes vibes, but this is on another level. Like, this gives me a lot. This is like someone trying to roleplay. Are they... Wait. Are they kind of... It's the green-eyed... It's the green-eared killer or whatever about the silver eyes that would be a really cool twist right it's it's like the story of the silver eyes in the game's universe that would be really cool um cool reference uh they run off while he's calling for their names he's limping and he takes a look at foxy realizing it wasn't an actual animatronic but a statue replica operated by ropes and ropes and pulleys to give an effect of a jump scare he put a hand to his leg and moaned what if i'd grabbed his thigh i hadn't let go it felt like a metal trap I glommed into his leg. Oh no! He realised he was bleeding. Perspective cut to Maddie, Ash and Nolan sneaking around. They sneak around in the hallways trying to find a path through the dining area as they watch Springtrap limp in the dark holding his thigh. They're bolting to uh, parts and service to hide. Perspective cut back to Luca. 
Luca waved his way through the dining area, heading for the front hallway when he got there, grimacing at the throbbing pain in his leg. The hallway was empty. Where had his friends gone? Cool callback. Uh, Luca trudged past walls, hung with more Freddy's posters, which along here were interspersed with yellowing and curling children's drawings. Luca continued on down the hall. When he got to the door leading to the parts and service room, he heard whispering. His friends were hiding behind the door. He found them. Now, Nolan, the asshole he is, thinks he's a big man and decides to fucking pick up an animatronic leg from the parts and service room and charge at Luca to hit his head with it. What on earth? Nolan is just... Oh, Nolan is... Yeah, he's, he's an asshole. Uh, Luca reacted without thinking and grabbed the end of the metal leg. He wrenched it from Nolan's grasp and Nolan stumbled back. Luca dropped the metal leg and lunged for Nolan. Yes! <laughs> Nolan spun away from Luca as he did. Maddie and Asher dashed into the hall. The three linked hands and tore away from Luca, heading toward the end of the hall. You can't hide from me, Luca called out. Again, he wasn't being a character. He meant it literally. If his friends hid, what was the point? Why are they bothered with all this dress up and charades if he was going to stomp around and they were going to uh, cower in some dark corner? True. Lucas strode down the hall after his friends. As he did, the rabbit suit shifted and something gouged in, in the ribs. Luca gasped and grabbed his side. This is getting annoying. This part is cool. Okay, okay, okay. He went down the hallway. He stopped, though when static spurted from the speakers overhead. Uh, a whirring sound burst forth, and then the tinkling sound of a little kid's laughter was followed by a child's voice calling out, Hello? It, yeah, balloon boy. Balloon boy's here. I knew it, he thought. In one of the VR games, the security guard used the audio system to play characters' voices to distract Springtrap. Oh, true. True. What Luca had just heard was one of Balloon Boy's lines. Yeah. It's not Springtrap's Revenge. That wasn't in Fazbear's Fright. Yeah. That's true. That was in a weird maze. <laughs> and we don't, we don't touch on it in the flash. Um, Luca had never liked the little animatronic boy holding the balloon sign. He couldn't believe he'd just let himself react to the recording of the character's voice. He saw his friends duck into a door and followed after them, and it led him to an office, the FNAF 1 office. Well, sort of. It's a hybrid of the FNAF 1 office with three, for some reason. Uh, there's no windows. Okay. He was standing in a duplicate of an old Freddy's security office. The small and dingy room held a scratched wood desk, a credenza, and a dented metal filing cabinet. Clunky monitors, dusty keyboards, and random pieces of paper covered the furniture's surface. A crooked old black metal fan rotated lazily on the credenza, it creaked up as it ran, and the breeze it created rustled the papers. Apparently there's no windows, the only escape would be a vent. He looks for one. And alas, a vent with its hinges hung open is there. Luca crouched down to think. He shouldn't have done that. Something snapped inside the suit. <gasps> Something that felt like metal teeth dug into his hip. Luca let out a yowl of pain. That was enough. The suit was dangerous. Luca wanted out of the game. We're over halfway. Okay. He's panicking and darting toward a door that says exit, pushes it, but realizes it's not a real door. This gif is being posted like a million times. He's trying to remember what the instructions at the beginning were, and he's trying to recall what, the, what he heard, remembering that the archway was the only exit or entry point, but he couldn't get out unless the game ended to prevent cheating. He's trying to find another way out. So Luca, and his, uh, so Luca had to find his friends and tell them he wanted out. He's trying to look for Maddie since... He knows she talks too much. For several seconds, all Luca heard was silence, but then he heard Maddie's giggle. He shifted to get a sense of where the sound was coming from, given how muffled the sound was. He figured his friends were in the ventilation system. He thought about going in after them, though through the open duct under the credenza, but they had a strong head start. No, he was better off trying to predict where they'd come out of the ducts. He's heading to the dining room, as he predicts they'll end up there when they leave the vents. Luca tried to pick up his pace, so he'd be sure to get in position before his friends got out of the ductwork. But the quick movement triggered another attack from the suits. Something pierced his stomach, and then he doubled over, clutching his gut. That's it. He didn't have to leave the game to get out of the suit. All he had to do was try to take it off. Don't do that. <laughs> Smile. <laughs> um, yeah. Luca reached up and back to try to disconnect the rabbit head from the suit's neck. Asher had said there was a mechanism back there, but Luca couldn't find anything to activate with his clumsy rabbit paws. And I need to put my laptop on charge. Uh, rabbit paws, rabbit paws. Uh, he pushed, he prodded, nothing. 
took me five seconds. I'm sorry that I'm not editing this out. <laughs> I cannot be asked. Wait. Okay, okay, okay. I am here. All right. Uh, Luca clamped his hands against the side of the rabbit head and tugged on it with all his strength. It was like it had been welded into place. This is a very good screenshot to show that. Okay, so maybe he had to leave the head on, but maybe he could open up the suit and tear it free from his body. <laughs> Your life is ahead of you, bitch. The spring locks are coming. <laughs> Luca attempted to free the hidden fastenings along the front of the suit. As soon as he fiddled with the first fastening, however, Luca heard a click. Uh, he was stabbed in the chest, the solar plexus, and the lower abdomen. He screamed. He had to find his friends immediately, he had to tell them what was going on. Because Luca was pretty sure he knew what was going on. And if he was right, he was in trouble, big, big trouble. Pain pulsed in his thigh, his ribs, his hip, and most of his torso. He didn't think the injuries were bad yet, but they would get worse very quickly if he didn't get out of this suit immediately. Luca's friends might not have believed the mythology of Freddy's, but Luca did. And part of that mythology was that these old suits could be lethal. There was a reason Springtrap had been called Springtrap. The original rabbit suit that Afton had supposedly used was a Springlock suit. Some Springlock lore coming up, FYI, could change some timeline interpretations. Really? Oh, this is exciting! Okay, Springlock suits were multi-use suits. They could function as either animatronics or as costumes, depending on which mode was chosen. I don't know how many times I've heard that line, by the way, in the series. So many times. In costume mode, the metal in the suit had acted l just like a collar stay or corset. It provided a sort of inner lining for the suit. In animatronic mode, the metal would engage the metal would spring inward to provide structure for the animatronic character. The suits were discontinued. Wait, the suits were discontinued not long after they were created because the locking mechanisms were often faulty. Okay. Me MCI 83 cannot work now because they were still using spring locks in 4. There was still a debate if replacement suits came. Oh, right. Oh, I see. Okay, so they were discontinued not long after they were created because the locking mechanisms were often faulty. So we're saying that the the bite of 83 has to be really early on. Oh, so that means that Fred Bears opened in 1983. Right? Surely. Surely Fred Bears had to be 1983. Because Fred Bears 1983... Uh, the suits were discontinued not long after they created because the locking mechanisms were often faulty. In other words, there was a spring lock incident. Oh, but there was another spring lock incident before the bite, wasn't there? Maybe? Unless it was a spring lock incident. I don't know. That's cool to think about. But um, that's a really good point. MCI 83 kind of can't work now. Because it has to be before the bite. But it can't be before the bite now. Okay. I mean, I've always believed uh, 85 anyway, so... Uh, they could get triggered by the movement of the costume's occupant, and if they were triggered fully, the metal clamps would shoot out and impale the occupant fatally. Here's the big reveal to what the costume is. It's not Afton's suit. He was wearing one of the original spring locks. That's interesting. Wait! Wait! He was wearing one of the original spring locks. I don't know. I don't know if this is, like, supposed to be mind-blowing. Like, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys are going crazy about this, but it has blood in it. It's, it's a spring trap. Wait, okay, so that means, no, that means I was right before when I was saying spring trap went to scrap trap because scrap trap is a different suit. Right? Right? I'm, I'm assuming that is what it is. They're spares. I'm very confused. <laughs> I'm just going to keep reading. Uh, he'd suspected it since the suit had first poked at him. He tried to convince himself that he was wrong. He'd just been feeling the ragged edges of a poorly constructed costume, he'd told himself. Surely Fazbear Entertainment wouldn't have put a real Springlock suit in the costume closet. At least that's what he tried to believe. 
but he'd known, deep down, he'd have known. And now he couldn't delude himself any longer. He had to face the fact that if he wasn't careful and he, if he didn't get out of the suit soon, he would be doing more than role-playing the story of William Afton. Love that line. This is brilliant. <laughs> this gif. Yeah, this is fire. This is great writing. He knew panicking wouldn't help, but the panic was stronger than his ability to reason. He's trying to get to the arcade area, holding his breath because he knows about the tapes saying they trigger the locks. He's very careful with his movement, smart man. Um, as he took one step after the other, Luca realised his fear was not actually the real reason for his pace of breathing. The pain wasn't the cause either. What was really causing his heart to race was anger. If Luca was going to get his friends to understand the crisis, and it was a crisis, he figured he had to wait until they were right in front of him. They wouldn't understand him if he called out. The suit muffled his voice, and between that and his pain, he knew he had to be close to understand. He found them. He was right where they are, were in the arcade, and they're busy trying to open the vent. He's hiding in the shadows of the room, waiting for them to come out. It's stuck, Asher whispered. Well, whack it, Maddie said. I did, Asher said. Move over, Nolan said. This is a man's job. Oh, shut up. <laughs> the vent cover vibrated, but it didn't come off the wall. You must not be much of a man, Asher said, not bothering to whisper. Maddie's like, be nice, uwu oh, oh oh. Be nice, and besides, Luca could be out there. You mean Springtrap? Oh my gosh. They are, wow. Luca needs better friends. Nolan's still trying to get the vent off. Luca can't see anything. He only hears sounds from in the vents. Manny let out a squeak. Sorry, babe. <laughs> oh no. Uh, Luca sidled next to uh, yeah. Luca sidled to the wall next to the vent cover. He put his back to the wall and waited. That spring trap energy. Uh, he heard Nolan grunt, and then the vent cover flew off the wall. It arced a few feet into the room and clattered to the floor. Nolan's feet peeked out through the vent opening. My hero, Manny said. Uh, Nolan slithered out into the room. Luca considered grabbing Nolan as soon as he was out, but Nolan was the least likely to pay attention to anything Luca said. He doesn't want to risk fighting Nolan and setting the locks off. Nolan bent over and stuck a hand inside the duct. He made an exasperated sound and yanked his hand back. Not you, idiot. Ladies first. Oops, Ash. Don't look. The dress is really short. <laughs> Eyes are closed, Asher said. They better be. Uh, Manny slips out the vent and she kisses Nolan now. This seems like it's just for the, the hell of it make-out drama and shit. No, this is actually part of the narrative. Luca is a genius. Luca hated watching Nolan kiss Maddie, but this kiss served to Luca. Nolan's eyes were closed and Maddie's back was to Luca. Luca reached out and grabbed Maddie's arm. Maddie immediately broke off the kiss. She screamed. Luca held on. He started to lean toward her, willing her to listen to what he needed to tell her. But as he did, something in the rabbit suit clicked. Gore, okay. Suddenly, metal gripped Luca's skull and his face, piercing through his scalp and the skin around his eyes, his nose and his mouth. His entire head was encased in what felt like a serrated vise. It felt like hooked prongs now fastened the rabbit head to Luca. The pain was scorching. It was as if a dozen fiery red pokers were trying to burrow their way into his face and cranium. He screamed. This is great writing. Manny managed to yank her arm free as Luca buckled from this new agony. Uh, the three turned to run from Luca. Wait, Luca tried to call out, but it couldn't come out right. Hey, the Silver Eyes fans. <gasps> what? Two of the searing metal clasps that had secured themselves to Luca's face curled into his mouth, a third one jabbed through his lips. He could barely move his lips and tongue. The unintelligible noise he had managed to make ended in a gurgle because blood was filling his mouth. Luca coughed and swallowed the blood. He gagged and tried to speak again. All he could do was make another garbled noise that sounded like a ghostly moan. Okay, so this this is what it says in the Silver Eyes. If you trigger those spring locks, two things will happen. First, the locks will snap into you, making deep cuts all over your body, and a split second later, all the animatronic parts they've been holding back with that sharp steel and hard plastic will be instantly driven into your body. You'll die, but it'll be slow. If your organs punctured, the suit will grow wet with your blood, and you will know you're dying for a long, long minute. So you'll try to scream, but you will be unable to. The vocal cords will be severed, and your lungs will fill your own blood until you drown in it. That's basically what it said, right? Yeah, you're, yeah. 
That is cool. That's very cool. Um, they think it's in character. Way to get in character, Ashley called out as they ran out laughing. Stop, Luca tried to yell out, but it only came out as a gurgle. He's mad. He's flipping tables over and stuff. Wow, this is really cool. This is cool. This is great. This is so in character as well. Like, um, because of course he'd be angry, but that's part of Springtrap's character. He's just in character. That is fantastic writing, honestly. So good. This is also um, kind of remnant. This is like the opposite of what Afton did in the novels, where he's like fake blood. Remember, this is real blood. This is not the real Springtrap, but it's real blood, right? So good. Uh, <laughs> uh, the laughs got louder. He could hear the footsteps slap against, across the dining room floor. He lurched to the party room, knocking into chairs and plowing through the, str uh, the steamers, streamers, sorry, which seemed to chitter in amusement as he passed. Everyone and everything was laughing, everyone but Luca. Rage just taking over him. He stumbled out the party room as his friends reached the other side of the dining room. He fell against one another in their hilarity, uh, as they watched him, he runs at them. Lucas started running toward them, but the molten jabs around his head appeared to be affecting his coordination. He tripped over a chair, reeled into a table. Part plates, fake pizza, and tablecloth fell onto the floor. That wasn't good. The rest of the locks in the suit went off. At the same time, a rapid succession of snapping sounds filled the suit. Lucas' arms and legs were speared by dozens of sharp projections that drilled through his skin with such depth that he felt like they were going all the way through him. As a wide receiver who got regularly tackled, Luca was familiar with pain, but not pain like this. It felt like every nerve ending in his body was firing an agony message to his brain. I hope you guys realise this is the first time we've had a Springlock POV. This is exactly what Afton went through. This is huge. Yeah, this is amazing. I'm so amazed at how good this is. Luca took a teetering step toward his friends. He reached toward them and tried to speak again. Help me. His friends kept running, thinking he's acting as he is in misery laying on the floor trying to cool up. He wanted to reach his friends still. He had to try to get them to understand. So time passes, and he begins to realise that he's lost too much blood. He shouldn't be alive, but he is. He's still light-hearted and can feel everything, the bores of the metal penetrating his skull and tearing his scalp, him choking on his blood, lungs fill flooded with it. He feels every movement. He is reanimated like Afton was. He Oh, this is really cool. His eyes are now cloudy and filled with blood, described as milky orbs. He's stomping through the hallways, gurgling and groaning each step he takes. He can feel his shoes still on, the blood sticking to his skin as a metal rod slipped right through it, making a sloshing sound every step he took in his own blood. Uh, meanwhile, his friends are goofing around with a panel that lets you either speak through an intercom or play scary voice clips. They're feeling goofy, silly, and stupid tonight. Uh, so they activate one voice clip and a creepy voice emits over the intercom. There isn't, there just isn't room in here for both of us. Is that what Nightmare Balloon Boy says? I'm assuming that's what that, that is. Um, that's pretty cool. That was spooky, Maddie said. Where do you think Luca is? Maddie asked. Ash looked down the hallway and he saw Luca. Luca ran at him as fast as he could. He tackles Ash, but the others run. But look back confused as to why Asher is standing behind. Asher! He tried to speak. It only came out as a nightmarish growl. Asher, the actor connoisseur that he is, is there in disbelief and compliments his acting, saying he is phenomenal. Luca is sitting there, trying to speak to get him to know how he truly feels. He can't speak. Eventually, one, once again, they run off, leaving him hit, uh, there. Luca is starting to think he should give up. He no longer cared about sending the locks off. The damage was already done. As he roams the halls, he eventually wanders into a backstage area behind the stage curtains. His consciousness is slowly fading out as he tries to look for his friends. Lined up on the racks were Freddy Fazbear's cost uh, character costumes. Their costumes were similar to the ones in the costume closet. But these ones were different. They were fuzzy with dust and smelled of mildew. But wait, you wouldn't expect two remnant stories in a row, would you? What? No shot. No shot. As Luca quickened his pace down the hallway, his mind, perhaps seeing a break from the pain, took him back into his memories. This is insane. His childhood fanned out in his head like a deck of cards. He saw snippets of his life for an instant before seeing next and next. Scott's done with our shit. Two remnant emotion-based stories in a row to show they're the same thing. I, yeah. <laughs> his memory cascade stopped on a camping trip he and his parents had just taken before the start of Lucas's senior year. It was at Camp Atenia. No, I'm joking. 
and it does the same thing into the pit said exactly the same. The camping trip came so clearly into his thoughts that it activated his senses. He could hear the crackling fire and smell its wood smoke. It was vivid. Reliving that moment as if it was real. Again, the revi vividity. Is that, a, is that a word? The vividness of these memories really shows the power of, like, remnant agony. Uh, he could feel the moss beneath where he sat. He could taste the stickiness of marshmallows. Suddenly a voice echoes to him in his memory. It's about groupthink, son. His voice dad echoed. His, his voice dad's. His dad's voice echoes. Him and his dad are talking about his friend, Remy, who was arrested for stealing a car for an impromptu drag race. Uh, Luca asked why... He, uh, Luca asked his dad why he felt the need to do that, to which he responded, there's something about the dynamics of a group that can override clear thinking. There's something that makes a person's inner compass go widely or skew when he or she is part of a group that gets fired up to go in a direction that at any other time would feel completely wrong. People in those situations take actions they wouldn't normally take. They listen to other ideas instead. Groups tend to dampen our inner voice. The one that tells us what's true for us. Peer pressure. Yeah, true. Uh, what's true for us? The four words echoed inside his head as this memory me movie went dark. The pain came rushing back. He was shot back to reality suddenly. The words resonated within him. When he's shot back to reality, the pain is significantly worse than it's starting to become unbearable. Um, he attempts to continue to look for his friends, but realises that he was left alone. He collapsed to the floor, giving in to the pain. He then cuts to Maddie, Ash and Nolan exiting. Didn't you see how awesome he was? That was stellar. Not bad, Nolan said. Not bad? He was stellar. All he had to do was run across a dark, fake restaurant. Luca did all the rest. You're just mad that he was the star and you were the player. Um, shut up, Ash. You're not funny. Ash rolled his eyes and waited for the arrogant Hulk to turn around. <laughs> Ash said, yeah, actually, I kind of am. Shouldn't we go back and check on him? He should be out by now. Nolan said, nah, he'll figure it out eventually. I'm hungry. Let's go get changed and get a pizza. And if he's not out when we're dressed and as smart as you say he is, he'll be smart enough to find us. Uh, perspective cuts. Luca opened his eyes. He looked out as at, he looked out at soft grey shadows. His mind felt mushy, and he felt disembodied, as if his consciousness was floating around in the ether. Where was he? He decided to sit up. He couldn't recall. He started to sit up. Luca returned abruptly and appallingly to his body. Stinging pulsations flared from his head to his toes. He tried to open his mouth to scream. Nothing came out. Suddenly, everything came back to him. He remembered his situation. He was stuck inside a springlock suit, and it was killing him. How long had he been lying there? With all his will, he commanded himself to get up. He rose above the pain and was going to go on in spite of it. He was told... He, oh, sorry. He told his nerve endings to shut up. Oh, he fought against the pain. If he gave up now, he would lose. He rose as misery vibrated through his very being. Luca had a sudden, re uh, sudden sensation he wasn't alone back here. Why did he sense that this person or thing wasn't one of his friends? He listened hard. But all he could hear was his strained breathing. But wait, there. Just for an instant. Had he heard movement? Just a second or two of the sound rubbing against the fabric of the costumes? Suddenly he heard the, do the sound of a door slamming in the distance. The sound of small children's feet galloping. In the dining room, out in front of the stage, a little kid's voices chattered. But he hid. There was no way kids wanted to see him in the horrendous rabbit suit. He tried to step forward. He had to stick to the plan. To get to the game's exit. But no, something was holding him in place. The suit is refusing to move. <gasps> is he going to kill kids? Wait. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know why I sounded excited. The suit is holding him in place. The suit is going to be controlled by the memories of Afton or something. Um, he can't control anything in the suit when he forced his will into the plan of escaping. Something was calling him an evil he felt. Was it some kind of mental con confusion from blood loss? Or was it something else? Something real? Something other than his own pain was putting him on edge. Whatever it was, he had to find it. This story is going on very long. Um, cool detail, but after this point, when his spirit has ascended out and then back into Springtrap, the story refers to the entire costume as his body, as if he became one with it. It no longer refers to the mask as a mask, but r his rabbit head. Just a cool touch, okay. He looked back into the area where he saw the boxes and costumes, and there he saw it. Lucas saw what he had been unconsciously perceiving, the thing that drawn him back here. It was Earl. I forgot about Earl. <laughs> wow. Standing with his back to Luca, Earl's unmistakable shorn head was about to be conceived in a cheap Halloween costume like Spring Mask. Looks like that suit Luca wore wasn't the actual suit that was supposed to be used for roleplay. The suit was calling him to Earl. 
My thoughts on this immediately is that it came off as if the suit was ingrained with Earl's evil, a demented man inspired by Afton. He wanted to become Springtrap and this, and thus stole a real Springlock costume to repurpose as Springtrap. This is why the suit itself was tied to Earl and drew him back because he wore it. Okay. Earl's body was covered by an equally cheap looking Halloween costume like Rabbit Onesie. Both the head and the body of Earl's suit were designed to look like the one Luca was wearing. Earl's suit, however, was obviously a costume, not a real Springlock suit like Luca was wearing. Oh my gosh! This is crazy! Earl pulled the Springlock, uh, the Springtrap costume head into place. He started to turn around. Luca jerked his own head back behind the curtain. What should he do now? Luca knew he was dying. But this entire time, he realised the idea of getting out of the game was something he was just telling himself so he didn't lie down and give up. He would have rushed backstage and tackled the pervert in the rabbit suit. He had to try. He attempted to lunge but stopped. Earl was gone, again. Where did that creep go? Luca is now in full protection mode because of his instinct after Kenny's death. If he couldn't save Kenny, he could save someone else. Hate is pushing through his veins. He no longer wants to achieve the goal of leaving and finding his friends. He can no longer care for that. Panning through the halls backstage, he looks for Earl. On stage, unknowingly, Earl was hiding under the stage speakers. Look at these, Amy. Aren't they so cool? He glanced at the children. Luca immediately came into the dining area the moment they started screaming. He, Earl, grabbed the girl named Amy. Don't get freaked out. Amy has never harmed in the end. Okay, good. Uh, the next few pages is essentially him looking for Earl. Lots of filler, but Lucas is driven uh, by his anger to find Earl and save the girl. Despite every waking moment b being pain. Yeah. Eventually, he finds him and stuns him. This allows Amy to bite down on the arm she was restrained by, and Earl let go. Luca made sure she went to safety. Now, he has to fight Earl. The story dehumanizes Earl, essentially calling him stupid for even thinking about fighting Luca. Uh, Earl's skinny frame had no chance against Luca's uh, heavy metal. He lunges at Earl and pins him to a wall in the supply closet, holding him in a headlock. Luca, uh, Luca is... No uh, I'm sorry, I've been speaking for a long time. Luca no longer is ready to deal with the bastard. He starts choking him and watches. Luca wrapped his ruined rabbit paws around Earl's neck and squeezed as hard as he could. His hands were merged with the metal of the suit. He pushed harder as they hooked into Earl's neck and tightened until Earl's airway was permanently blocked. He's just sitting there, mercilessly watching. Earl can no longer breathe, so he's squirming on the ground of the supply closet, kicking all around him. He knocks over a broom in the process. He squirms for a minute or so. Oh my gosh, Earl's body kicked and thrashed against the floor of the storage closet, kicking out brooms and mops for what seemed like a lifetime. During that lifetime, Lucas's, uh, Luca's memory spooled out his mind for one last review. He witnessed his entire life again, he got to relive that chance of moving on. Finally, Earl went still. As soon as Earl stopped moving, Luca finally let himself give in to the inevitable. His body, ex everything except his hands, which seemed to fuse with Earl's neck, went limp. The last thought Luca had, before thoughts were beyond him, was that his inner compass was working again. His final act had not been someone else's. It had been his own. The end. Oh! Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Um... <laughs> Okay, I have a lot to say about the story. Also, I just realized Clethophobia intro is surreal as well. So this is crazy. This is so crazy. All of these stories are amazing. Uh, let's just read this. I want you all to know what significantly makes this story better is the realization of the memory of his dad talking about the inner compass and peer pressure. It gave the title of the story meaning the ending was him overcoming that no longer influenced by others actions he resisted that pressure and he instead helped his inner compass by killing off an evil that he needed to remove to have himself redeemed his inner compass was healed he let go of the pressure ah oh, i see okay okay very cool i don't have much to say about this other than mind-blowing story law significance to do with spring trap possibly scrap trap the fnaf one location um, uh, i mean the first freddy fazbear's or whatever which probably was the FNAF 1 location, let's be honest. Uh, I think this is alluding to the fact that it is, anyway. Um, this story is mind-blowing. Tell me what you think in the comments below. Uh, 
Yeah, and I'm so excited to go on to Cleithrophobia, seeing as it's something that Frights have never done. Um, so yeah, I'll see you then. Goodbye.